action. Alright, Chris. So as a longtime Californian, mm -hmm. you know, I, clearly I'm aware that we live up close and personal with fires and I've been educated through the years that, um, you know, indigenous people knew how to live with fire, you know, it, they, they did burns, they, you know, they, mm -hmm. they tended to things and all, um, you know, in part being moderns, we've gotten away from this sort of depth of field and relationship with the natural world mm -hmm. and so we're not really clued in as a result and it occurs like fires come out of nowhere but we're actually mm -hmm. living in a natural environment where it's part of it so um, if you could speak to that some and then we'll kind of build out from there about how um, it's a relational you know world and, and right. so our solutions are also relational. Well, it's interesting. A lot of people look at fire as a, uh, in the forest or others, like this destructive force. It's evil or such, but it, it's not. In fact, it's a critical uh, natural process in the vast majority of ecosystems in California. So many plants, almost like the rain or sunshine, they need fire right. to be able to survive on this side. And so it's a natural role. It's critical, you know, for a lot of ecosystems. It's just when we put our ecosystems in the middle of the natural environment, their built environment in the natural environment, this is where we have these consequences that are kind of coming up. So I, I think that looking at fire as um, sort of this this bad thing, it, it, it's, it, that's not exactly right. It's just we've chosen to live in an area which fire is a critical part of, of the natural system. And so we've got to learn to coexist uh, with wildfire. And it, it's fascinating that whether you're, the, the, the types of fires that you would normally have, it varies across the state. So, uh, and we're finding that because we've changed the normal type of fire, we're starting to see some of the consequences there as well. Uh, for example, historically uh, in the Sierras, in the, where you had the, 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 the pine forest and others, uh, natives or lightning would, would ignite fires every five to ten years and it had this nice little happy fire that kind of came and cleaned out uh, the forest every ten years or so but for a hundred years we've got really good at putting wildfires out when they happen and so now it's missed up to like ten cycles of this natural fire in the forest and so you've got ten times the amount of fuels that uh, would normally uh, be there so if you're saying, hey, I think it's a great idea, we can build our house right in the middle of that, you know, that's an absolute recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. So if people were clued in about all of this, the kind of things that they would want to take into account and are taking into account, because there's um, different guidelines that pe the state is aware of mm -hmm. that they have in place and all. Um, and then you said something that I found really interesting about how uh, some people take a position that density is the problem, but actually some of the newer homes, because of what they take into consideration, can become that and the infrastructure can become a benefit to the older homes that don't have some of the measures and things in place yeah. and how they were built. Well, it can. You know, we're the only state in the country that has a uh, building code specifically with wildfire in mind to try to be able to keep uh, the, the homes uh, resistant to ignition. Uh, but that was only been in place since 2008. Mm -hmm. So we've literally got millions, millions of homes that are out, you know, in these natural areas uh, that uh, are very prone to ignition. Um, and we've seen it over and over where, you know, with the new construction that's been there, that as fire rolls through an area, if it's built right, you know, up to the new codes, you've done things to, you know, prepare your property, like you've got things, uh, uh, you've got landscaping that's not ignition resistant and, and other things, um, it can, it's, it's very resilient, you know, to fire and it's very unlikely that homes actually will burn. And so it's interesting that sometimes people say, oh, it's sprawl, you know, it's, it's, it's we keep building out in the wildlands. Well, 
because we've gotten better with you know the way that we do things with our homes and designing communities it can serve as this buffer that it's almost uh, it's almost like a fuel break in itself where mm -hmm. you've got these homes mm -hmm. are there and the fire is coming through and if it's you know again if everything is done right it can actually serve as that buffer to the older homes that would be in the interior uh, that be away from the fire now this is of course this is all very nuanced so I, as a lay person, I'm just living my life, and everything is already seems like a lot. And now I have to take into consideration things like fire, <laughs> possibly burning down my town or you know my home, losing everything and all. So how do I start to fit that into my life? How take steps and become involved? Are there uh, resources to be educated? I you know I hope that this conversation becomes a resource and we mm -hmm. can lead people. And, and directions and all. What what might that be that people would want to? You know? Well, on a national basis, I think uh, sort of uh, the first place to start uh, for a resident would be Firewise USA. They have a really good program where it talks to residents. Here are the small steps that you can take to kind of reduce your risk um, that that you have. So we've got things that the resident can do by themselves. We also have different laws on books in terms of like defensible space, home uh, construction, etc. But that only goes as far as you know the laws that are enforced. Right. Um, and uh, there is some reluctance I've seen in some circles. You know, it's like people don't necessarily want to enforce the rules uh, in terms of defensible space because uh, a lot of times it falls upon the younger firefighters and that, that's the last thing they want to do <laughs> you know yeah. they don't want to be a tree cop as they have been told you know right. they, they they want to be the good guys they want to come in and save the day mm -hmm. but honestly to save the day a lot of times you know again getting back to that prepare the battlefield is setting you know setting the stage to make you more successful mm -hmm. so what make make you look like a bad guy in the end, you're going to be come in, you know, looking like the guy with the white hat. You know, be scripted. <laughs> um, well, clearly, you have a lot of passion for this, and I, you know, I looked at your background and all. You, your your original way in was through forestry, so I imagine that's a love of the forest and a love of wild things and all. Did you start out knowing you were going to end up as this authority and the, the way of like <laughs> tending fires, or how did you get there? Well, I was just a poor kid from Arkansas, so I never thought that this would be living in California trying to keep people's homes from burning to the uh -huh. ground. But, I, you know, I did come in from the forestry world, and um, it, it's intriguing when we look at all the different people, the stakeholders that are trying to find solutions for this. In, in my world, everyone thinks, you know, with foresters and ecologists, like, oh, we, we can just uh, use prescribed fire or thin the forest, and that's going to take care of everything. But that's really not the problem. You know, that helps. That certainly helps doing all these sorts of things as you know, stopping fire from moving across the landscape. But, you know, the real issue comes down to the house itself. And so, you know, having builders and architects and landscape architects and uh, city and regional planners, you know, it's all these disparate sorts of disciplines that are needed. It's critical uh, to have all these groups come together to find solutions that are holistic in nature because we have to take a systems-based approach because there's so many things that potentially can go wrong and if all you think is like one aspect of the problem you know you're, you're, you're doomed to failure what you're doing some sort of solution may help but there's a broad spectrum of things that we can do to, to, to improve mm -hmm. you know our community so I'm getting that we have a shared passion which is having people come together and find solutions in unison be more of a fabric because I asked you about your passion yeah. getting from the forest to fire and you <laughs> talked about people coming together <laughs> uh, so you're a professor at Cal Poly and and you're teaching this to young people and what what is the the arc of information um, practical information that ends up coming out of this course that they take into their lives well, it's, it's interesting. I think that uh, a lot of the students that come into our program, they think that they're either going to be a, a hardcore firefighter all their life, and I just keep telling them, it's like, your knees are not going to, you know, very few people are able to do that, or they think that they're going to end up, you know, driving in a pickup truck with their dog and not seeing a soul, you know, and it makes them happy, and it's mm -hmm. like, but... Uh, Again, it's a it's a people problem, and you know, tell them with the science, we know 
how to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. But you know, working with the uh, with with people, whether that be politics as we're going through the the various systems to try to get in development, mm -hmm. uh, working with trying to incentivize communities to take the actions that are going to make them more fire safe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to to coming together for education and, and you know working through. So it is it is a people problem, and I tell them you've got to get ready for people because that that is the core of the issue. You've got to learn to work with different types of people that have different values and, and learn to work with that to try to come up with a, uh, a perhaps a negotiated compromise that's going to bring the uh, the risk down for everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Neat. And then you said that you have this uh, young person, graduate student uh, gal who's looking at memory and, mm. and sort of the human aspect yeah. of how we deal with um, crisis or ongoing endemic things. Yeah, she's uh, she just started, but she has a, a really interesting take on it, which I completely agree. And we're finding ways that's like, how can we kind of uh, uh, test our hypothesis that uh, uh, that we have this institutional memory? And you know, a big fire happens, uh, might be two towns down, and everyone all of a sudden they start doing all these great things, the things they should have been doing for the right. last 20 years. Right. But then memory fades, you know, kids have got soccer practice, you know, we've got other things that are out there. And we, we forget about that. Attrition. Yeah, and, and we end up just getting back to the same problem in, in, in areas that are very fire prone. And I think that's just the human condition. I mean, I, I uh, lived for a while in southern Louisiana and uh, they floods a lot there. And I was watching the news one day and this woman was shoveling, yeah, shoveling mud out of the house. And it's like, well, this sounds horrible. This is awful. How are you dealing with it? Like, well, yeah, this is a bad flood, but it's not as bad as the one last month. You know, so <laughs> it's a sort of repeated cycle of loss. Losses. And so trying to get at that, you know, stopping the cycle of just the repeated losses where we need to get to. Wonderful.